Let's talk about Mary. Let's talk about, you know, I mean, she's your oldest sister. What was your relationship to her? But then, who, how do you see her clearly, both as, how did you see her as a child at the time, looking up to her six years older? And how do you see her now? Huh? Mary was at a decisive disadvantage. She was the oldest in the family. You know, she was the, the guinea pig. They tried out techniques on Mary and, and uh, improved them, and then they worked on us. But Mary was a very quiet gal, and uh, she did whatever my parents told her to do. She never argued, as opposed to your mother, who was really too hot to handle. But uh, I'd have to bring your mother into it anyway. But, but Mary was a, a typical older daughter. She, uh, she listened to my mother and father. She helped them prepare. She cleaned the house. Uh, she she prepared the food. She took care of us. She walked us if we had to, to go see our... And one of the things that we did virtually uh, once a month when we were kids was to receive communion. And one of the requirements is to go to confession, which we never did. But we did go to see our aunts and our uncles and ask them for forgiveness for something that we never did. <laughs> but... She always took us to, uh, I, I remember my, my aunt's house, uh, my aunt uh, Marianthi and my uncle Mike, and there was always a wisecracker. Are you receiving again? What do you do, receive every week or so? But Mary made sure that uh, all the orders were followed, all of the instructions that uh, our parents, especially my mother left, were followed to a T. Uh, she'd get upset once in a while at your mother who uh, either did not want to follow through with the orders or want to do something else, something entirely different. But uh, Mal was entirely different. Uh, when it came to uh, cleaning the house, which she had to do about, she shared every other week. Uh, she did a bang-up job, or at least the beginning of a bang-up job. Unfortunately, halfway through, she start reading a book or decided to go out shopping or something. And I recall quite often that I, I wanted to go to bed at night. My bed was still standing vertically, leaning vertically up against the wall. She hadn't put it together, but uh, she was okay, too. She, she followed her order, or, uh, you know, not orders, but her instructions and directions, but she questioned quite a few of them. She would try to repeat the... Uh, Emancipation Proclamation to my, to my parents who knew nothing about what she was talking about. But, you know, she, uh, she felt that, uh, you know, they were a bit too pushy. But Mal was born ahead of her time. She was, a, unfortunately, a 60s child who was born in the 30s. And at times she was a little, a little too much, too hot to handle. But... Uh, I think I benefited quite a bit from uh, Mal. She, she had conditioned my parents, you know, as to uh, what she made them a lot more lenient than they would have been had she not been around. But Mal was good. Mal was, uh, she was a good sister. I didn't enjoy the best of relationships with him. We, we argued quite a bit. Uh, I can honestly say there were some people that lived in our tenement that met for years and never knew we were siblings. And very often, as my wife said, I told her that sometimes I would cross the street just to avoid, you know, confrontation with her. But uh, as we got older, as I mentioned, we were, I think, the best of friends, and uh, I really miss her. After you were married, she was the only one that you could talk all times with. Absolutely. When, you know, when you... Losing your siblings is, is tough, especially if you're the youngest in a family. There was always Mary and Mal that you could run to and ask, uh, how are we related to so-and-so? 
how did uh, you know this come about? What's our relationship with this individual or that individual? And you always got an answer. Now, very often I'm I'm greeted by some people. I know them. I can recognize them, but I don't know the relationship. And unfortunately, there's no one that I can go to. You know, I think, well, I only have one cousin left from my father's side, and she was never really involved that much. That's Pauline. And I actually have nobody in the States that's still alive that were uh, from my mother's side. And that, that's tough. But so be it. That's life. So tell me, tell me something. Give me an experience with Mary and Papu where you really saw some time that he, you know, I don't, just like his love for her that just came through. Something that she did at some point in her life, the support he gave or something like that. Well, you know, Pop had the store, and I worked quite quite a bit at the store, and Mal worked as well. Uh, Mary never worked in the store, but she took care of all of the accounting, all of the bookkeeping, and she used to fill out the ledges. And my father was, uh, you know, forever indebted to her because uh, when his accountant came in, everything was neatly you know, listed all of the expenses, all of the income, all of the expenses were were properly listed. And it, it was a really, it was a snap for the accountant to go through and come up with a, uh, you know, a profit and loss statement or come out with a, a, a tax bill that my father had to pay for. But I thought he, uh, he was very proud of Mary from that standpoint. It was by far the most, uh, it was most difficult at that time to be an oldest child. Firstly, uh, the parents were, you know, not capable of speaking English well. They learned from the first child. When Mary went to school, I'm certain that she knew very few English words. She was, you know, uh, she just spoke Greek. So she was the guinea pig for all intents and purposes, and that's how my parents learned, they, from uh, especially my mother, from her. My father had very little to do with us, you know, uh, you know, as far as uh, you know, uh, raising and upbringing us, and he uh, he worked many too many hours. We only saw him on a uh, a Sunday afternoon. That was the only time we saw I mean, he, there were times when uh, you would wake up in the middle of the night and he, you'd see him opening a door and looking at us and then asking my mother how everything went. But Get back to Mary. Okay. I'm sorry. But Mary certainly had a difficult time. But she was a, uh, I think, a very easy child to rear because she was... She listened to everything my parents said. She did it to a T. She never argued, never opposed them in any way. She was just great. And she was uh, good looking after both Mal and myself. She protected us. Uh, she, she made sure we were comfortable in every way. She made sure we ate. Uh, if we were going to bed before my parents came home, she made sure we washed ourselves and, you know, we did everything that we should be doing. And uh, she, she was a terrific older sister. She uh, very protective. And uh, I told you, uh, one of my memories was uh, I get 42 cents a week from her because in her paycheck, which was cash, was 42 cents change and she gave it to me and I knew she'd get paid every Friday and she'd rip that op envelope up and give it to me. Um, what else can I what tell about, you about? What about, we did talk about, you know, when Papa was, was uh, very proud of her. I mean, can you remember a moment when Yaya really showed her, I don't know, some sort of validation? 
I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, like this... You know, one thing I could tell you that uh, she was a very sickly child, Mary. She, uh, it was touch and go whether she would live. And I remember my, my parents spending an inordinate amount of time going to doctors to see Mary. I think something was wrong with her eyes, amongst other things. But, uh, you know, these are stories that I've heard from my mom. My father used to tell me when we'd walk home from the uh, store, he would tell me all about these things. But, uh, and uh, they, of course, they were very jittery. They lost their first child. Their first child was a, a boy that I think was two years older than Mary that uh, lived for about two months, maybe a little more than two months. And uh, he, uh, they knew in the very beginning that his, uh, his life would be a short one. But uh, Mary coming on the heels of that particular adventure, you know, made them, you know, very scary. But uh, she was able to, uh, to live through it. Uh, they were always proud of Mary because Mary was there all the time. She was there to follow their orders and, you know, to, to make them happy, to make them feel at ease taking care of the children. She was always there. She was a good student. She, uh, she did very well in Greek school. She was a good dancer. Uh, Mary was just fine. I think uh, if they had their druthers, uh, if they could see their way through, they would have had five Marys. They made a, the excuse me. Now what? What are you thinking about now, Mary? Yeah. No, she <clears throat> she made them very happy. I mean, when we traveled, we had to travel to uh, Greek school to Seventy uh, Fourth Street. She she took care of us. She made sure that uh, we got on the train and got off the train. We held hands walking to Seventy Fourth Street. <clears throat> she was like a second mother. I mean, more so to me than to. Uh, to Mal. You know, the unfortunate, unfortunately, as a the youngest child, all I could tell you is in my relationship with Mary, what, how I saw her through my eyes, uh, five, six years younger than, uh, than her, you know, five, six years uh, her junior. But uh, the other things I've pieced together based on what my parents have told me, what uh, relatives have told me. But uh, Mary was wonderful. So let's talk about the move, everybody moving away from the city, away from the tenement, out into the, you know, how, 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 did, how, how about that, you know? I mean, I know that's, the, that's and, part of the immigrant family, that's the immigrant family journey. That's part of the, oh. the journey that you make, but you know, and then leaving the parents behind and all, just, Talk about that, that whole thing. Well, I think our parents were very happy for us that we did indeed move out of the tenements and uh, try to improve our lives and try to offer our children a better lifestyle than that they offered us. But uh, going to, back to the tenement was uh, quite difficult. I remember, specifically remember a, a 12 month period in time. It was back in the 70s. There was a uh, gasoline shortage and uh, going back to, uh, to visit, uh, visit Yaya and Papu for that matter was, uh, you know, quite difficult. You know, we were trying to ration our gas and make sure that uh, you know, our, our primary needs were satisfied, but uh, we did manage to get there. I, I, I had hoped uh, that my parents would move out of the, uh, and they almost did, 
move out of the tenements, I, I remember uh, the first incident I may have, may have uh, related to you when uh, Papu was anxious to, uh, to buy a brownstone. I think his plan was to uh, open up a little store and make a living, rent out the two apartments, but eventually take one of the apartments and move out, move out of the Lower East Side to the Lower West Side. Uh, and another time he indicated to me when I happened to move to Astoria, he kept questioning me about uh, the janitor of my building. And excuse me a second, I just got a little dry. And I told him he was a an older man that uh, Do you have your bottle? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. That had to uh, you know perform a series of duties every week. He had to make sure the garbage pails were out for the people to put their garbage in and then to return the garbage uh, <clears throat> pails down to the basement. He had to sweep and mop. And he asked me, he said, do you think I can do something like that? I said, of course you can. And uh, he showed some interest. He even went as far as asking me to keep my ears open in case somebody's looking for a janitor, provided, of course, he was able to get a, uh, an apartment as part of the payment. But, uh, I mean, Yaya stayed... At, on, in Roomsty, I think Papu died in 73, and she didn't move out until 86 when she really had to. I think she, she had that problem with her, her hip. She fractured a hip, and uh, she was... It was before 86. It had to be before 86, because I went <coughs> to Greece in 79. Oh, yeah. I think it was, she was there definitely by 81 she was out in Jersey. No, no. 86. I know that for a fact. She moved out in 86, and uh, the first thing we did was move her to... Uh, well, she had spent about a year in the hospital on Long Island. Apparently, she couldn't get out. There was a... She had a staph infection. Unbeknownst to me, I found out later. I found out when it came to... Uh, to pay them the bill, they told me where even Stephen. So apparently, the fear of uh, her getting uh, suing them for, for getting yeah. a, a, a nosocomial right, gen right. generated uh, right. Yeah, uh -huh. but I th she did move out in '86, and uh, I recall. Uh, oh, I, I I recall like yesterday. I remember that. Uh, <clears throat> I was able to talk her into going to the uh, old age home in Yonkers, New York. I told her that uh, she would be most comfortable there. I mean, uh, she'd get along with all the people. They were all Greek-speaking people. I think they had three or four church services every day, which, uh, you know, really met with her approval, and I thought I had her agree, uh, her agreement to proceed, you know, the next step in trying to get it, get her into the uh, <clears throat> old age home. But apparently she was a pretty coy woman. Uh, I think she couldn't wait till I left her apartment or wherever she was at the time I, I, I really felt great. This was probably one of the major milestones as far as accomplishments in my lifetime. But I should have expected it because I think that night the telephone wires must have been running real hot. She spoke to both of her daughters and apparently the message she sent is that your brother is going to send me to wherever, to Manchuria you know, to uh, an old age home, and I frankly don't want to go there. And the next day, uh, I got a phone call first from Mary saying, uh, you're not the only decision maker. You, 
you got to get us into the decision-making process. The old lady doesn't want to go there. So uh, I said, fine. And then your, your, your mother called and she kind of repeated the same message to me. Then I finally met with the, uh, my two sisters and I said, well, she can't really live with me. Where is she going to go? And Mary said, I'll take her. And I warned Mary. I said, Mary, do you know what you're getting into? I said, you don't really know this woman. You know, you've been away too long. And she said, no, no, no. I'll take her. I said, well, if you, if you agree, fine. You know, I'll pay all the expenses, whatever she needs, and then some. Well, she did move there. And I think it wasn't more than two or three days after she had gone there. And she said, Georgie, like she said, hey, Georgie, you were so right. I should have listened to you. I can't live with her here. I said, Mary, what are we going to do now? So fortunately, your mother intervened and she said, uh, why don't we build a basement apartment at, uh, in Hawthorne? So again, I said, whatever you need, I'll pay for everything. I said, and your father wanted to do everything. And I told him, Arthur, you don't have to do that. Just let's go out and buy it or let's hire, let's hire a, uh, a craftsman and let him do whatever he has to do. But Arthur went through all of that and uh, that worked out for a while, but that also had its problems. I recall quite often when there was a heavy rain. Apparently, a lot of water leached into, uh, you know, the apartment. And I remember your mother or your father calling me and said, you got to get her out of here. There's much too much water. So she would come here for about three or four days until the water receded. But uh, finally, I was working full time. There's no way. Finally, it, it got really bad. You know, you may have been right, Billy. 81 may have been the time she moved out. 86, I remember, was a good friend of mine who you know, Gus Karras, arranged for me to have a meeting with an Ar Armenian gentleman who was the, uh, I guess he was the general manager and CEO of the Armenian home in Emerson, New York. So uh, I went to see him on a Sunday afternoon, which I would not have done for anybody else because it happened to be a, a football season and it was a game that I, I had to give up. <laughs> but in any event, I did go see him and he told me, well, he said, the best I can do is to put her application, you know, on the bottom of the pile and she can wait a turn. And then somehow or other, he stuck his hand out to me and he did this to me. You know, I thought now it would be giving me five, but so I stuck my hand out and I stretched my hand out and my five fingers showed. Unbeknownst to me, it meant give me 500 bucks and I'll move her application to the top of the list because he gave me a call the next day and he said, get her ready and bring her in tomorrow and bring the $500 also. So I brought $500. I just gave it to him. And uh, we were lucky that we were able to get Yaya into a, a nursing home because uh, she must have had a series of uh, TIAs at the time. And she literally lost her mind. She didn't know where she was or who she was. Uh, she would call me Angelo. She thought I was a brother. She would uh, ask, when we finally got her in there, she'd ask me to give her a can of beer, which she would guzzle down. She never drank beer before. So you did a lot of things, but thank heaven we were able to get her in there. And everything was fine. Until about, was it two or three months later, maybe four months later, apparently things were, the cells in her brain were, were getting together and working out their problems. And one day we happened to be there 
and she finally realized where she was. And she said, you, you, she told Dina, she told my wife, from you, I never expected this. From him <laughs> pointing at me, I expected it. But she finally realized that she was in a, uh, a nursing home. But, you know, a couple of months later, everything was fine. She, she got involved with the people there. She was minding everybody's business. She knew what everybody was doing. She, she would go up to the uh, Alzheimer's wing, Alzheimer's wing, and talk to the patients there. And I would tell her, Mom, they, not, they can't, they don't understand. No, they can understand me. They know what's going on. But uh, she enjoyed a stay there. And then one day I got a call and they told me, uh, you know, your mother is, uh, she's not, she's doomed. She's, she's, she's almost out of it. So uh, I ran over there. I saw the doctor and he told me, I don't see her going. If she lives through tonight, it'll be a miracle. And uh, she said, the acid test will be tonight. So the old lady apparently was taking all of this in, although she, she didn't indicate any way, in any way that she understood what was going on. So we went home and, you know, I, I was getting ready to start making funeral plans. And the next day, I called up and I said, how's everything going? He says, she's fine. So I went to see her. <laughs> Apparently, she did listen to what the doctor said. And she heard, Tonight, tonight will be the acid test. And she interpreted that to mean, to test. I'm at the to So she said, to to test. I said, what do you mean? She said, I saw St. Nicholas, she saw all the saints, and he said, I'm in good shape, to and I'm going to be all right, and I'm going to go up and see the Alzheimer's. Uh, patients, because to to test, I know what's going on. So she thought she had, you know, supernumeral uh, uh, powers, but uh, she lived a few more months after that, and she was just fine. And then uh, she died. Of, she died a peaceful death. One morning we got a call. I guess about six o'clock in the morning, and they said, "Hey, I hate to tell you that your mom has passed away." You know, please start making, uh, please start making uh, preparation. So, and that was it as far as, far as yeah, yeah. She bowed out very quietly. I think she lived uh, an interesting uh, last uh, six months or so, and she uh, she thoroughly enjoyed herself in that Armenian home. She she was able to go to two or three Orthodox services. Uh, there were Catholic services. The only ones that she didn't go to was the Jewish services, and I think she would have gone to that if she lived a couple of extra months. But uh, she was fine. She, she was fine. Well, firstly, I honestly feel that my parents were held in high regard by, uh, you know, their contemporaries, their immigrant friends from, from Greece and precisely, more precisely, from Lemnus. They were really held in high regard. Uh, we were raised to uh, respect these people. Everyone who was our senior was called uh, Theo or Thea. We visited them quite often because uh, you know, exchanged visits. On New Year's Day, my mother would send myself and my two sisters, to visit about 20 different apartments. And what we did was sing the calendar, you know, the, uh, the, the famous uh, New Year's Day song, uh, you know, Ayos Vasily Sergete. And we would go through five, six, seven stanzas, and we would be given... Uh, How about just one for us right now? Archimenia, <laughs> Archichronia. 
Ψήλι μου δέντρο λιβάνια κι αρχή, κι αρχή καλός μας χρόνος, εκκλησιά, εκκλησιά με Άγιος χρόνος. And we would go on, we had it all memorized and, you know, the, the people would be admiring us. Uh, probably the only children that went to all of the homes that we knew to recite the song. And we got a handful of nuts and then proceeded to the next house. And my mother was as proud as could be when uh, a couple of days later she'd meet these women and say how great your children were, how nice they looked, how, how great they sang. But uh, living in downtown New York was a real wonderful experience. Uh, you know, you just about knew everybody. We knew all the Greek people. Uh, When I was still going to St. Barbara's, everybody was there. Uh, we'd go to picnics, two or three picnics a year, or two or three dances a year that was sponsored by the uh, Lemnian, uh, the Lemnian clubs, the Women's Auxiliary, or the Lemnian Club itself. We'd go to dances that were sponsored by St. Barbara and picnics, and everybody knew each other, and you were... You always knew that you were being, you were well protected. If there was any problem, someone would come to your aid. There was always, we, we had no fear whatsoever. Did you play I mean, ball in the streets though? Oh, I, I played ball. I did everything everybody else did. We played punch ball and stick ball in the streets, uh, even when we weren't supposed to. And uh, I did a lot of things I weren't, wasn't supposed to and got caught most of the time. The biggest uh, problem I had was with my uh, my aunt. Uh, Mariati. No, I forget her name. <laughs> And that's what, my uncle Mike's wife. Oh yeah. She used to live uh, in the next tenement house, but all the way up on the fifth floor. Never went out. Never went shopping. Never did anything. Just used to lean out the building and knew everything that was going on. Well, one day I happened to jaywalk. I ran right across the street. I came down. I didn't bother to look and see if any car was coming. And I got hit by a car. You know, it hit me in my elbow. I, I turned around. I hit another car, but I really banged my elbow. And I just looked around and everything was clear. Nobody saw me. I looked up and I didn't see her. So I figured I'm, I'm in the clear. God is with me today. You didn't fall down. You were standing. He, But you got pushed. When I got home that night, my elbow had really blown up. And I was, you know, kind of hiding it or as much as I could hide it. But my mother knew right away because my aunt told her. And she came and she squeezed my, my elbow, which was really swollen. And I let out a yell. And she told me what had happened that uh, my um, Fotini was a name. Thea Fotini saw you. Oh, another incident I remember. I happened, to, it happened to be on an Easter Sunday and I must have been, I couldn't have been more than five or six years old. And we were going to see my Aunt Marianthi. My mother dressed us in our Easter best and uh, I remember I was wearing short pants and a jacket my sisters were in their hats dressed as nice as could be and we happened to be walking we took a shortcut and went through Roosevelt Park you know which was between uh, Forsyth and Christie to go down to uh, Hester Street the corner of Hester and uh, Christie where my aunt lived And uh, we we're walking through the park, and in the middle of the park uh, was a little, uh, it was like a, uh, a wading pool, a big wading pool for the summer. It wasn't summertime. There was no water there. It served as a baseball field, as a softball field, amongst other things, and a track. And I remember climbing up a few poles, and I was entertaining my sisters or showing off. And I was walking on this very narrow ledge until I came to a, uh, a door that 
sworn with two half doors and had these middle, big metal spikes. And I tried to very carefully and gingerly walk through this one very, very narrow area, you know, tippy toed, balancing it. It was like a balance act. And I remember I slipped and I fell and one of these iron things caught me right in my pants here and it ripped my pants right up the seam really bad and now my showing off my laughter turned to immediate tears what's going to happen if my mother caught me or found out so we ran to my uh, aunt's house and fortunately my cousin Theoni was there and she was a seamstress she was terrific uh, you know, with needle and thread. She made my wedding So dress. I begged her. I said, please. I said, can you do anything about this? And my aunt, who was terrific, she grabbed me. And I was a, her, her youngest, you know, nephew and niece. And she, her children had been much older by that time. So she said, it's a secret. I'll never tell your mother anything. So I felt so relieved that between my, my aunt you know, telling me it's a secret between us two and be be between Theoni sewing it up. I felt great. And we spent the day, the holiday was great. Two days later, I came home from school. And no sooner did I get into the door, I caught a right on my face, a slap on my face. And it, don't you ever keep a secret from me again. I want to know everything that happens. So the first thing I thought of was, you know, my aunt sold me down the river. My aunt, who I love that much. And I wouldn't talk to her. But uh, she was crying when I told her, you told my mother. She said, I didn't tell you anything. She said, believe me, I didn't say anything. And she was crying and she, was, she had like a bowl full of jelly, her, her stomach. And uh, I remember her. And then... Uh, she told me, she said, I swear to you, I didn't say anything to your mother, but my mother apparently was looking through the closet and found something that just didn't look quite right. She, she could identify my, uh, my cousin's stitches anyway, so she got my cousin in trouble <laughs> and my aunt in trouble by, you know, making me feel the way I felt. But in any event, I, I recall that incident. <clears throat> Tell me about Yaya's cooking. I... I mean, there's the, the way you felt about it at the time and as opposed to now. And I mean, you know, I, I, obviously she wasn't, she did what she had been taught. She was cooking traditionally. But what do you think about the cooking? I mean, cooking, baking, all, you know, that. Cooking, that sort of, you know, I think her cooking was fantastic. She was um, really, really a very, very, very good cook. And uh, she made a lot of, she, her stews were the best. Her stew is a chicken with uh, string beans, chicken with peas and potatoes. Then she would make lamb stew. She would make uh, a beef stew. We had lamb very often. We, on Sundays, we had a real good meal. We either had a, a leg of lamb, a chicken, you know, a real, a real nice meal. That was the, the only meal that we really had together with my, my father, but... Uh, she was good. She, she really, I think, put a heart into it. And she was, she was known for her baking, her kulurakia and her kurambiedas, and later in life, her, uh, what were the, uh, the things that, that we attacked one night when we just got married? Oh, Galatopurico. <laughs> she didn't make too much baklava. That was a, later in life. She made... Uh, Viplis, which we called uh, Luludia. We call them Luludia. Flores. 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 Um, she excelled in that. She was very good. And uh, we, had, we had pretty good meals. I mean, there were days when we only had rice pudding. You know, that was our meal for the day. Or, you know, maybe once a week we either had rice pudding or we had... Uh, Bananas and sour cream. That's if she had to work late. She used to help my father at the store. She worked uh, maybe two or three hours a day. She would go during a lunch hour. When uh, 
Mal and I would come home from school for lunch. She had everything prepared, and it was great during the winter time and during the autumn because we had uh, she put it on the radiator, and everything was kept nice and warm. But she had everything all set up for us. She was a good cook. She uh, she used to share a lot of her uh, her stews with uh, a lot of neighbors. It was a uh, common place for. Uh, when a neighbor visited to bring a bowl of what they had cooked that day and my mother would exchange with them, but uh, real good, real good. Do you remember her teaching Mary or Mal how to do things, whether it's sewing or ironing or cooking like that? Because I remember when I tried to, you know, there's a couple of dishes she made that I love and you know, I said, how do you make this? Oh, I don't know. Oh, no. You know, oh, well, I, no, I, no, I, I don't could. know how much to put it. Now, you now you're questioning me. No, you no, know. It's, it's no. Not, it wasn't that thing. It's like, oh, I can't remember how much mm, to put yeah. it. You know, I, went, like, I, I love the way she made, um, I love the way she made uh, Galamaria, where the oh. rice inside oh. and stuff. Oh. That, I mean, I've been trying to make that for years since. You know, the stuff Calamari, you know, yeah, the body. So, yeah, she's so well, no, she cooked it with she's, the raw, the rice was raw inside. Yeah, yeah, it. she steamed and so it. That, and, and, then, and, it's, and then it cooked It inside. cooked inside. Never these. I never had these. Oh, that wasn't the tomato sauce. That was the best. That was Because a, the rice would fill them up so they would be stuffed full. Mm. Yeah. Grow inside it with this. It would, yeah, stuff. they'd get, the, the rice would swell. Mm. In fact, uh, that's how she used to lure me to, when I got married, she said I made, uh, you know, calamaria, and uh, or I made giftedes. Giftedes were, the, were her best. She really made, uh, you know, good, uh, good, good meatballs. Mm -hmm. But everything was good. Her stews were outstanding. Uh, you know, even her. Uh, she made a very thick uh, split split pea soup. What do they call it in Greek? Split pea. Fava. 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 She made good fakes, you know. Yeah. During Lent, you know, she was good. Her fish, her tsipuris, fried tsipuris were outstanding. Her smelts were outstanding. I mean, uh, really. You can sit down and eat a pound of it, but uh, it was great. She was good. She was good at... Uh, I, I saw her, the best of her cooking was when uh, your mother was getting married, you know, everything was to be prepared, uh, except for a few items that we bought. Everything was prepared by my mother and her friends. And uh, they were terrific. They made meatballs, they, oh, you name it, they made it. Everything was cooked in the house. I remember your, uh, your mother's wedding. We went the night before with your father, and somehow or other he was holding a a tray of meatballs, and he tripped on a step, and we had all of these meatballs. That was at rolling. our wedding that happened. That happened at our? He dropped our meatballs. Oh yeah, that was at our wedding, yeah. <laughs> uh, no one, no one uh, took ill or anything. You put them back they're, in? They're a little glossy because the, the uh, apparently the caretaker there had just uh, polished the floor. So they had a nice sheen to them. <laughs> they had a nice sheen to them. But uh, no, they used to get together. I, I recall uh, going to picnics uh, with uh, my, my family, and my mother would, would prepare for, you know, like five other families coming and sharing with us. That was, uh, you know, really great times. I mean, I remember outings to, uh, on Memorial Day. We would go to the cemetery, and she would cook a five-course meal, you know, for her kids and her family, but always sharing with another family. Her table on uh, uh, New Year's Day was fantastic. You know, chicken, and she had uh, one thing that they made, pazza. I don't know if you know what that is. Yeah. Oh, she made, oh, she made a wonderful pazza. It was... Uh, I guess pig's knuckles, pig's feet, uh, very gelatinous, it would come out, and uh, very, very uh, garlicky. It was very garlicky, and it had little pieces of pork in it, which were good, but uh, people loved it. And 
she would prepare at picnics and at uh, dances where you had to bring your own food. Yaya was there with, uh, she almost catered the whole thing. You know. Papu in his later years used to help her out a lot. Uh, you know, he used to buy a leg of lamb and he would, he would cut it and uh, slice it in his own fashion, the correct way. You know, really. I have some of his knives, you know, but that's my, the ones where he would sharpen them like this, yeah. so they looked like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a side yeah. wave. <laughs> uh, so, well, what about, you know, so, but did he teach, did she teach the girls things like sewing? I did think, I, mean, I don't my, know. My mother did never learned how to cook. I don't think you, no, your mother didn't. But uh, Mary did. Mary, you know, again, being the oldest, she even had responsibilities. That I mentioned that time that when, when they went to Greece, Mary was doing uh, all the cooking. You know, there's no such thing as eating out. Once in a while, I'd bring some cold cuts from the store, but we rarely, you know, uh, ate store food. I, even my father. My father would come home at night, and he wanted to, you know, he wanted my mother's cooking. So... Uh, I don't think your mother had the patience at the time to uh, to sit down and be uh, be taught, you know, how to cook. But she did fairly well when she uh, when they first got married. She did well. <laughs> I remember my I remember you know basically we had and you know granted there were a lot of kids at us very soon, and um, I remember Monday was uh, Chinese food from the camp. Tuesday was porcupine balls. Wednesday was forget yeah, to thaw the meat. Porking, for, you know what? Forget to, to forget to thaw the meat stew. It was the same thing every Monday, every Tuesday, every, you know. Really? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And we were just so grateful to eat. But what about what about making soap? What, what oh about, yeah, um, well, making soap. She uh, well first even before the making of the soap, uh, I guess in the late thirties, early forties. We had an ice box. We didn't have a refrigerator. And uh, she would salt a lot of pork. So we, we had, you know, pork wasn't refrigerated, but it was treated and she would reconstitute it and cook it. The same thing with, with fish. Bacallaro, that was, uh, you know, all salted. And that's how she would buy it. And uh, the day we were, day before we ate it, she'd start, uh, you know, uh, dehydrating it so that, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was edible. But uh, we had the, the refrigerator. In the wintertime, we had uh, the outside of the uh, kitchen window. She had a box where she kept the food, uh, you know, cooked food. She was a good cook, and she was... She was a good shopper. I remember shopping with her. I remember going to uh, the uh, the Mott Street, uh, what do you call it, uh, push carts. And then there was the, uh, on Essex Street, there was a uh, WPA, a New Deal development. It was an indoors market. And I remember going to that, but we would buy bread from a, from a bakery I remember your mother and I used to eat half of it, half a loaf, by the time we got home. I remember pizza, $5 a piece, which uh, I could share with my two sisters. It was uh, a uh, Sicilian pizza with no cheese. It was just tomatoes and uh, anchovies. Five dollars a piece? I'm sorry, five cents a piece, oh. which we were able to share. Yeah, uh, one piece was much too much for one of us. But... Uh, what about the soap? Talk about the soap. Oh, the soap. We oh, no. Understand. We, we, Ma, Yaya saved all the fat. And uh, when she thought she had enough, she would uh, boil it and run it through, uh, you know, some uh, cheesecloth to take out whatever solids there were. You know, either burnt, burnt meat, carbon, or whatever, titbits here and there. And then she would uh, make soap by mixing lye with the soap itself. And the finished product smelled awful. It looked awful, but apparently it had, uh, it had cleaning powers. But she did that until very late in life. 
in fact, I think until about 20 or 30 years ago, we may have still had a couple of pieces that uh, she had left us. So that was a, uh, a popular thing. Uh, Do you remember that song? I remember yeah. You know, it was, it was for smell. washing clothes. Mm -hmm. It was for hand yeah. rubbing on yeah. clothes. And, and then all that, she, because she, she put it in that bowl and then cut it at these oblique mm -hmm. angles so everyone was like a three-dimensional rhomboid. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, they, they, they were hand sized. Right. You know. uh, See, that I, bathroom to me was, it was, it was mystery. That bathroom to me. Right. Because it had, because you'd see these, you'd see Papu's um, wound up, <laughs> he, you know, he had this thing for his hernia. It, was, it wasn't a truss, it was... It was a piece of linen, linen, yeah. linen, linen. I called it the rack. He would, it, it was like a half a block long, and he would start at one end, and he'd <laughs> keep going around while it, you know, it kept his uh, whatever it was, a hernia. He also, he couldn't, he couldn't work without it. It would, you know, he said, I just can't stand up without it. And he got used to it. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, he wore his long johns, right through until uh, the 4th of July, till the 15th of August. That was, and then he went back to them. I remember another period of time uh, during, during World War II. Yaya also went to the store in the late afternoon and evening to help him because we, we never had enough help. Uh, my cousin Tom, who was, uh, you know, an important part of the uh, store, was in the service, and we, we had another guy that cooked, and the other help, you know, would last about a week or two, and it was imperative that uh, Yaya go to help him, and we were left at home by ourselves, and we used to entertain ourselves by uh, listening to the radio. The radio was much more popular than television, you know, and uh, it was good because you can do a lot of other things, you know, while you're listening to the radio. But we were really uh, engrossed in a lot of the shows, and we would sit together, and some of them were were really scary. And Mal and I would sit under the table, and you know, hold each other and listen to the uh, to the shows. But uh, that was the way we entertained ourselves, you know, quite a bit. Do you remember um, times when you, I mean, this is very common in immigrant families, I don't know by this time they were older, but um, where, the, where the child is learning English well in school and has to mediate for the parents in some official thing, you talked about occasionally translating things. Do you remember that happening a lot? Oh, I, remember, uh, I remember the period in time that my mother was preparing to go to... Uh, to take her test, the uh, naturalization papers, and she was actually going to uh, Seward Park High School for t two nights a week, and then we would come back and test her for everything that she she had learned. But uh, I told you about my father's uh, trials and tribulations during a war with the Office of Price Administration, and that was a shame because he could have. Uh, he could have earned a couple of more thousand dollars. He literally killed himself working for almost next to nothing. And was, he, he could have shown that to either of his daughters. You know? Yeah, I guess. I guess. But uh, he made a, a big boo-boo. Mm -hmm. He had read, uh, misread misinterpreted what was written to him. When the war started, the, there was a price, Office of Price Administration. They regulated everything, and they said there will be no more price increases until the end of the war, when you're told again. But you're permitted one more. And he did not see that, or he did not interpret that properly. But in any event, that, that's water over the dam. But... Uh, yeah, you know, we used to we we had to tell them really what was going on, but you know one thing I can tell you about my mother, every time there was a open school week, she showed up at the school. She wanted to find out firsthand, you know how we were doing, and well, she knew that we were doing well, but she wanted it. She thought it was uh, incumbent upon a parent to show up. 
that's how you you love and you show interest in your child. But uh, how did she get there? She'd walk. She walked high school. High schools were very close by, and most of the time. Oh, Mal and I were in elementary school. Thea Mary was in uh, junior high school. And then we'd start advancing. I think Papu was an exceptionally wonderful... <clears throat> you know, you always said that. Don't give yourself a tough time. And a very kind, a very to... kind individual. He shared his wealth with a lot of people, people he didn't know. He, he felt sorry for a lot of customers, as I mentioned before. He would rather see them, you know, their stomachs full of uh, food rather than money earned through the sale of their food. He, I don't think he had an enemy in the world. Yaya used to come on strong but she was basically a very fine, God-fearing individual. She was uh, strict with her children, but I think did a wonderful job raising them. Uh, that's that's what I can say. They were fine people. Couldn't ask for two better two better parents. The background. Mm -hmm. There's. I, I remember when the Aya was living with uh, on on in Hawthorne with with Mal's pet, you know, in that house. You know, she had a walker at that point, yeah. and she would walk around the neighborhood. But she always had a scissor in her pocket in her apron, because she was superstitious. And you know, you believe that if you want, you couldn't ask someone for a cutting of their plant. You had to steal it. So you'd see her, I would, well, I'd, I'd see her, she'd look around, she'd go like this, she'd look in every direction. She'd and then go snip. Up to something, snip, and put it in her apron, and then, you know, move on. At least someone watching. Actually, let's just, let's just, that's the, this is the last thing, Ronnie, give us two more, two more seconds. Superstitions. What superstitions did they have? Hmm. Many, many, many of them, and I'm trying to think of. Everybody oh, can be okay, other I could tell you. Community too. It doesn't have to be Yaya, but it there was be a, the Greeks of that time. There was a uh, an instance where I had, I'm sure, if I if I remember correctly, a case of the hives, and it was awful. I had, you know, everything was red, blotchy, my whole body, my face, and uh, someone came to see us, a, a woman by the name of Anna, you remember her, her daughters and her, her granddaughters, and Her's she toast. said in Greek, kapios matiase to pedisu, which someone gave you, okay. the evil eye. Oh, yeah. So we had an old lady, her name was Helen, they used to call her Lignon, that appeared to have uh, developed a knack of uh, reading certain prayers or certain nonsense over the uh, person who was inflicted with a problem. And uh, she had a remedy too. So we soaked in hot water and uh, they threw some herbs together with wine, oil, but they did go away. Apparently the hot water had something soothing. There was another time at the outbreak of World War II, oh. we had in honor of the serviceman, these big banners, which were spread over two tenements, you know, opposite each other. And they were really tall. They would go up to five, six stories high. And as a youngster at the time, the object was to throw a ball over them. And <clears throat> I did that, but I heard a snap in my elbow and I was certain that I fractured my elbow. And I showed it to my mother. I got, you know, smacked in the face for throwing a ball that high. But uh, she said, we have to go see uh, the voodoo lady, Lignon was her name. And she started massaging my arm and putting a whole load of uh, herbs together with a mixture of wine, hot water, and she was really hurting me. And I started crying, I remember telling my mother. And we went home, 
And uh, the next day was a Sunday, I think, or whatever. I, I told my father about it, and he took me to the hospital in the lower New York, Gouverneur Hospital, and they x-rayed it, and I had a fractured elbow. <laughs> but they believed in that. They, uh, they believed a lot in the, uh, the evil eye, and uh, if someone, they would actually, women would expectorate on you and say, uh, that's how they, they got the evil away from you. Uh, or whatever it was, but uh, she did believe in it, I'm sure, to a degree, or at least she made out she believed in it. Well, when Judy was, um, when Judy was pregnant with, with Elena, which would have been 89, no, not 89, 86, mm -hmm. 86, you know, Yaya, she was supposed to be the super specialist with telling the, the, the the sex, the sex yeah. of the child and yeah. you know we didn't want to know we wanted to have a surprise and she says oh the way you're carrying oh look it's got to be a boy watch. it's a boy it's, it's a boy, be a boy. Yeah, definitely a boy yeah yeah, yeah that was it they were always wrong uh, they were always <laughs> they were always boys then. and if once in a while they got it right this way but this way <laughs> oh, they, you know it, it, it you got to place yourself in their shoes here people hadn't even gone to school in their native country. They come here as young teenagers. They immediately go to work. They're, they're faced with a, an, a new world, a new way of living. They have no parents to ask. You know, I think they did a bang-up job. They tried their best. And I think what helped them was the fact that they did have a, a good support group. They had a lot of Greeks living among there. They had people that, who would, would run to their aid, you know, if anything was wrong. Another, na another thing I should tell you about my, my mother, as soon as someone passed away, even if she didn't know him, or he, uh, she, she would take us to the uh, wake. And we would sit down, and your mother and I would sit at the end, and we would be staring at the uh, deceased. And, you know, your mind plays <laughs> games with you, and you think they're blinking. Uh, one time, <laughs> one time we went to a wake. There was a sad wake. I think two, two youngsters had already lost their, their father, now lost their mother, and they had nobody else, I think, other than an uncle or an aunt to look after them. And uh, we went, it was very sad, a lot of people were crying, and this older woman went in to pay her last respects. And apparently, she must have overeaten or eaten the wrong food, and she bent down, you know, to, to wish, to pass on her, uh, respects to the deceased, and she let out air. And not only was it silent, it, it was loud. And everybody started laughing, and we were castigated because we were sitting, <laughs> we were dying laughing in the middle of the wake, but uh, these things happen. And you know, the other thing about wakes, uh, a lot of them were held in the apartment houses where the people lived. They, they just couldn't afford to pay the rates that were being, you know, people couldn't afford to pay the undertaker the, the cost of, uh, you know, renting out a room. So yeah, you'd go there, you go into the room, and then you'd be visiting your friend about a week or two later, and he'd say, come and sit down on my bed, and you say, I, don't, I really don't feel like it. You know? But uh, hey, a different world, different times. We learned a lot from them, and they certainly learned a lot from us, but uh, they were good people, and uh, I wouldn't trade places with anybody at this point. Well, they were, they were basically 19th century people living in the 20th century. Correct. Correct. Who were further impacted by uh, a voyage to a new world? Not knowing the language. Well, no, it's really quite tremendous what they did. No? 
a very, very tough, uh, a very tough generation. You know, they call the uh, the people slightly older than myself, your father's generation, the greatest generation. But I think the greatest generation are those who came, who migrated from Europe to the United States. Don't you think so? No matter, hey, no matter who comes, they're the greatest generation, no matter what you Yeah, come. you're right, you're right. You know? You're right. That's, you know, leaving it all behind. <clears throat> but, you know, their, their willingness to adapt, to assimilate into a nation, into a country that was so very, very different from theirs. <clears throat> their desire to become Americans, <clears throat> their desire to uh, embark upon the American way of life, the importance of having their children, you know, being accepted by their generation. Very different. I think it's, it's, you know, it's also 